what does it matter that victims have access uh, and can participate in proceedings, whether they be criminal or civil, regarding uh, corruption? Uh, and for me, coming from a human rights background, I see a lot of parallels to human rights and international criminal law and the way these fields have evolved over the last few decades. Uh, so first of all, like international criminal law, crimes of corruption and especially grand corruption uh, are almost by definition carried out by the powerful who have the ability to create impunity for themselves, for their family members and their associates. And so the quote unquote normal operation of the state apparatus will generally not work well and will generally not be enough. This is especially true in states where grand corruption is the product of a bargain among corrupt elites, organized crime and captured state officials. We're starting to see specific immunity laws for corrupt procurement in the COVID context. And this for me proves the point about impunity and the need to uh, do something to try to minimize it. Um, there's also a grave danger of sweetheart deals uh, with national prosecutors and or judges who either may themselves be part of state capture or who can be persuaded to desist from prosecuting, from judging. Uh, and that means there needs to be an outside check on how proceedings are conducted through access to files, access to proceedings or otherwise. Uh, third, reparations, if they're provided to the state alone, may go right back to the corrupt networks within the state. Uh, there's no guarantee that such reparations will go to those who are most hurt who are usually the poor and marginalized unless they're present to advocate for themselves. <coughs> Excuse me. Fourth, a lot of work in transitional justice and international criminal law talks about the importance of victims agency in societal healing. Research from transitional justice shows that the ability to confront wrongdoers, to show the effects of their wrongdoing on victims, to have them perform acts of reparation, sends a strong signal about societal norms and helps change the culture. This is particularly important given the focus on prevention in the UN uh, Convention Against Corruption. Uh, in particular, Individuals, communities, and groups often act as whistleblowers, able to see and denounce mechanisms and effects of grand corruption, often at great personal risk to themselves. This gives them a stake in proceedings. Also, they will often know facts on the ground that prosecutors will not, and can contribute to the information based, especially given the complexity of these cases. Given all this, civil proceedings are often not enough in part because victims don't have the investigative resources of the state, and because in many states there are obstacles like bonds, short time frames, et cetera, to civil litigation. In addition to this, uh, as I mentioned, there is a desire of victims for more than just money, for truth, for justice, and for reform. And so for all these reasons, it's important to talk about the role of victims with respect to access and participation in uh, both criminal prosecutions and also in civil cases. And you don't have to choose between the two. Now, second, sources of international law that form a framework within which anti-corruption law is enmeshed. So there are areas alongside uh, anti-corruption law that are really important to think about. One, of course, is human rights. Human rights law not only imposes positive obligations on states to ensure rights, but requires access to a fair proceeding and access to remedy. The Inter-American Commission Report on Corruption and Human Rights from 2019 and the report of a number of US UN rapporteurs and expert groups have posited obligations on states regarding participation or access to information and regarding reparations in corruption cases. Um, collectivities recognized through, for example, ILO 169, the UN Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, uh, have become a more salient feature in international law. 
the rights of victims have expanded in international criminal law as well through, for example, the Rome Statute, and in environmental law through concepts like the rights of nature itself and expansions of the right to information, access, and participation through, for example, the, the um, uh, Escasu uh, Treaty. All of these are in addition to basic concepts present in all legal systems of the right to damages from the tortfeasor for harm caused. So how does this translate into uh, anti-corruption law? I'm gonna share my screen for just a second so as not to have to tell you this, you can read it yourself. So here are the provisions of the UN Convention Against Corruption that talk about civil society and victims. Uh, participation of civil society in Article 13. Uh, Article 32, enable the views and concerns of victims to be presented and considered at appropriate stages. Compensation for damage. And this is clearly not just about the state because it talks about entities, plural. There's only one state. So it can't just be talking about the state. Uh, and uh, prior legitimate owners and compensating victims of the crime. So there are a lot of places where the convention itself makes clear that we're not just talking about the state as the entity that has been harmed by corruption. And that means that there have to be other uh, participants in the fight uh, against corruption especially when it comes to cases within the criminal system. Now, this all begs the question of who is a victim, right? We're talking about the concerns of victims. Uh, we're talking about victims of the crime. So who is a victim? Well, we have an answer to that in international law. Um, here's this place to start, the UN Declaration of Basic Principles of Justice from 1985. Persons who, and I, I wanna underline individually or collectively, have suffered harm. Uh, including several different kinds of harm. Uh, I added in the uh, Inter-American Court Advisory Opinion so that you can see the specific rights according to, co according to collectivities as such. Uh, and let me just add, um, this same idea of victim has been extended in international human rights law with respect to uh, international human rights and serious violations of humanitarian law. But it's basically the same idea, individually or collectively suffered harm. Um, that's all I'm gonna show you, but I did want to talk a little bit about emerging jurisprudence uh, on this subject. And my colleagues on the panel will talk in great detail about some of this jurisprudence, but I wanted to try to give a global sense of trends uh, and especially of positive trends. But let me start out saying it's not all positive trends. There are still a number of cases where courts have denied access based on the idea that the state is the only victim. But this is changing. Um, there are two kinds of cases. One, uh, laws in many countries allow the participation of victims in criminal cases as private prosecutors or as interveners. Um, but the problem is the definition of victim, as we've seen. Um, <coughs> where there is a clear and specific harm that can be plausibly traced to the act of corruption, courts are starting to allow intervention. Uh, clearest examples involve competitors who lost contracts due to corrupt bidding processes, uh, but a human rights and environment lens shows others. Uh, for example, the Honduras cases that my colleagues will discuss. Cases of patients hurt because of faulty or useless medical equipment bought as part of kickback schemes. Uh, forest dwellers whose home is destroyed because of fraudulent logging schemes. Massacre victims where corrupt cops aided in abetting organized crime killing. 
issues. An example might be the Onsa case in Argentina, where there's a train crash that killed and injured a large number of people because the train maintenance budget had been pocketed by officials over several years. In that case, two ex-ministers of transport were jailed and victims participated in the criminal case. The other way this is happening is through representative groups or NGOs participating in cases as representatives of the public interest. Many of you will recall that this was the route used in the ill-gotten goods case against Oviang in France. Uh, in Latin America, a number of countries allow public interest organizations to intervene in cases involving the interests they represent, including Argentina, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, Costa Rica, Bolivia. Uh, most of these are generally about diffuse or collective interest. Uh, Argentina's is specifically about crimes against humanity and grave human rights cases, and the courts there have found that grand corruption is a violation of grave human rights. Uh, Costa Rica specifically does so in corruption cases. Um, some of the cases that uh, exist now have to do with access to the case file on a rationale related to access to information. Public interest groups might want to know what's in the file, both as a check on uninterested or complicit prosecutors and as leads for further investigations. Uh, there are a number of Argentine cases that allow anti-corruption public interest group access. Uh, a recent Mexico case allows case file access to two legislators. Uh, so there are um, the beginnings of a trend uh, in this uh, direction. Let me finish by posing a couple of problems and solutions. One is who can be counted as a victim? There is a need to establish that the international definition of victim is appropriate for cases of corruption and to use rules on causation that take into account the difficulties of proof. Uh, where it doesn't yet exist, it would be important to allow damages claims to be brought by victims within criminal processes. Um, how do we do this? Well, we need a campaign of model laws, encouragement for states to adopt legislation, allowing both victims and uh, as uh, representatives of victims, longstanding public interest organizations to participate in proceedings to represent the interests of victims or diffuse interests. Um, we also need much more thinking about reparations. Um, and what to do when there are a lot of victims, uh, what to do in thinking about reparations holistically, not just about money, but about a whole range, uh, including the right to truth, including uh, societal reform as part of reparations. And then finally, something that we don't like to talk about much uh, as, um, public interest organizations and activists, but there is a cautionary note that I want to sound. And that is that there are risks of politicization of corruption prosecutions that we need to take into account. The experience of using corruption or money laundering as charges against political enemies, look at Lula in Brazil, look at Solorzano Fopa now in Guatemala, look at cases in Nicaragua. We need to work on safeguards outside monitors, due process protections, public access to grounds for charges, uh, inquiry into the legitimacy of complainants. Uh, we can't just assume that whenever corruption charges are brought, they are uh, legitimate and on the side of the angels because we've seen that that is not necessarily the case. Uh, let me leave it there. And I'm very interested in hearing what my, um, uh, companions on the panel have to say specifically about the cases that they're involved in. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Naomi. Um, I think there's going to be a number of questions for you in the Q&A session about the role of victims. And um, I would like to turn it over to our next panelists, speaking of victims of corruption. Um, our next speakers are Adriana Greaves and Estefania Medina. They're lawyers and co-founders of Tojil, a nonprofit law association dedicated to combating impunity in Mexico. And they will share with us their experience as women and leaders of a civil society organization fighting corruption in the case of Javier Duarte. Welcome Adriana and Estefania. <laughs> 
Muchas gracias. Eh, voy a compartir rapidísimo la presentación. A ver si la puedo presentar. Ahí está. Listo. Eh, estamos muy contentos de estar el día de hoy aquí, muy honradas de compartir el panel con grandes celebridades y queremos platicarle nosotros en específico pues nuestra lucha que ha ido eh, desde la miela de Estefanía que ha venido eh, desde Tojil, una organización que tenemos dos este, rubros o dos ejes en los que estamos luchando. La primera es la inequidad de género que sufrimos y ahorita lo, lo, lo haré concreto en el sistema de justicia penal y el segundo justamente es el tema de corrupción. Muchos preguntarán qué tiene tienen en común pues justamente la inequidad de género y la corrupción y básicamente y la respuesta es que los dos son factores que llevan institucionalizados, es decir, unas problemáticas que llevan en nuestras instituciones por muchísimo tiempo y que estas dos, la inequidad de género como la corrupción, se han vuelto factores que obstaculizan el, el real acceso a la, a, a la justicia. Es decir, no solamente la corrupción hace que las instituciones no estén funcionando y que no estén persiguiendo delitos, sino que las mujeres tienen como este doble obstáculo porque además de la corrupción, tienen que saltar un segundo obstáculo, que es esta inequidad de género que existe dentro de las instituciones en nuestro país en particular. Ahora, sabemos que existen muchas formas de incidir en la mejora en la transformación o, en, o incidir en, en mejorar, eh, hacer transformar la justicia penal en nuestro país y en toda la región de Latinoamérica. Sin embargo, nosotros, desde nuestra organización que se llama TOGIL, hemos decidido utilizar una herramienta que es el litigio penal estratégico. ¿Por qué decidimos usar la, el litigio penal estratégico? Básicamente por dos, dos ventajas. La primera es que nos permite conocer a profundidad, o sea, el ser litigantes nos da constantemente la, la, la facilidad de conocer las problemáticas, de la profundidad de las problemáticas y, este, ¿cómo se llama? Irnos actualizando en las mismas. Es decir, nosotros como litigantes dentro, estamos utilizando como usuarios del sistema de proceso penal, podemos ver dónde están las problemáticas de corrupción gestándose desde abajo de los operadores, que son justamente los operadores de hasta abajo quienes tienen el primer contacto con los usuarios, es decir, víctimas, imputados y víctimas indirectas. Y segundo, eso nos permite identificar justamente estos criterios erróneos o dónde están esos eslabones donde no hay controles adecuados que están permitiendo que la corrupción se geste dentro de las instituciones. Y la segunda razón por la que usamos el litigio estratégico es justamente porque una vez identificadas las problemáticas desde abajo, pues nos es, es sencillo llevar la lucha a los propios tribunales. Esto es decir, estamos tratando de arreglar y hablo en particular por México, un sistema que está podrido desde adentro de corrupción con sus propias reglas, es llevando todas estas problemáticas identificadas a los tribunales. Ahora, esta lucha que nosotros estamos dando hacia afuera, también quiero mencionar que la estamos dando hasta hacia adentro de nuestra propia institución, es decir, hasta dentro de la organización Tojil. Y me complace como señalar que en México, y, no, y, y creo que hablo por otros países en Latinoamérica, la lucha anticorrupción en particular en materia penal, es decir, la materia de derecho penal ha sido reservada en ocasiones a hombres. Y no es una, una labor que en, en los países como México las mujeres sientan que pueden explotar o dedicarse a eso. Nosotros nos enorgullece decir que dentro de la institución de Tojil, la gran mayoría, si no es que la totalidad, son mujeres litigantes, somos mujeres litigantes penalistas y somos las mujeres las que estamos dando la gran batalla de luchar contra la gran corrupción en nuestro país. Y no solamente estamos tratando de intentar de romper este status quo o romper paradigmas en materia de género y permitir que las mujeres participen en estos roles y romper estereotipos, sino que adicionalmente estamos dando una batalla en materia de corrupción en particular, que también lo estamos logrando o queriendo lograr eh, romper un, est un estereotipo del que ya mencionaba la, la, la doctora Naomi en su intervención anterior. Tratar de definir quién es o no, quiénes son esas víctimas de la corrupción, eh, hoy en día el marco internacional, como ya muy bien explicaba en la ponente anterior, eh, habla de que son la colectividad o los individuos que sufren un daño. Sin embargo, hay un problema serio. La colectividad, ¿cómo vamos a recortarla o hasta dónde se puede? O sabemos que justamente en los delitos de corrupción es difícil recortar o, de, o probar la parte probatoria de hasta dónde hay un daño directo o indirecto. Y nosotros, 
con base no solo en ese marco internacional que ya bien se mencionó, sino también en el marco jurídico mexicano, estamos este, convencidas que no solamente una, un individuo, sino que la colectividad, es decir, todos los ciudadanos de un país se ven afectados por los grandes delitos de corrupción. ¿A qué nos... ¿A qué nos referimos? Pues que claramente si millones de dólares o los recursos son desviados y la población no, es no se ve beneficiada por desde carreteras, salud, educación, es decir, los servicios públicos no están llegando a las personas. Y creemos que, como bien se mencionó, la problemática no debe de caer en probar que tienes un daño directo, sino que entender que esta... Red, grandes redes de corrupción afectan pues, a la totalidad de la colectividad. Y creo que nosotros desde Tojil hemos estado dando justamente la batalla en que se reconozca que todos los ciudadanos mexicanos nos vemos afectados por la gran corrupción que ha habido en nuestro país. Aquí es importante, y haré un paréntesis que se mencionaba, eh, de por qué nos interesa que la sociedad civil participe en los procesos penales. Ay, perdón. ¿Por qué nos interesa que la, la sociedad o por qué nos parece importante que la, no solo la sociedad civil organizada, sino los ciudadanos tengan una participación activa? Porque su, en otros países o en, o, en, en otras realidades, las instituciones que están que fueron formadas para investigar y en su caso sancionar los, los hechos de corrupción, funcionan. ¿Pero qué sucede en países como vemos en México, donde esa corrupción está permeada e interna dentro de las instituciones que tienen encomendada la función de investigar, recibir denuncias e incluso este, impartir justicia en los temas de corrupción? Lo que vemos es que se da un círculo grandísimo de casos de impunidad. Y estos gran, esta parte de impunidad Unidad justamente fomenta y se vuelve un problema, un círculo vicioso difícil de romper. Es decir, si no tengo instituciones que les interese perseguir la corrupción, entonces el status quo de todo el país es vivir en un estado constante de corrupción. Entonces, el primer paso que decidimos y nuestro gran caso que ahorita con mayor profundidad les platicará mi socia Estefanía, eh, no, es un caso importante y difícil y muy difícil técnico, técnicamente y jurídicamente porque en realidad estamos denunciando a la fiscalía por haber recibido probablemente un soborno por parte de un ex gobernador en México que cometió además hechos enormes de corrupción. Entonces creo que con esto, Estefi, te cedo la, la palabra para que expliques un poco la profundidad y el gran res, este cómo hemos estado rompiendo y logrando este gran precedente que va a ayudar a que en un futuro, eh, como he mencionado, ¿no? la sociedad civil pueda tener acceso, dar transparencia y participar en los procesos de eh, corrupción. Muchas gracias, Adri. Nuevamente, muchas gracias por la invitación. Eh, me reitero igual, encantada de estar aquí compartiendo eh, este panel con todos nuestros especialistas y contarles rápidamente en qué consistió el caso de Javier Duarte. Javier Duarte eh, fue gobernador de un estado en México, el estado de Veracruz, y después de diversas investigaciones periodísticas, como quizás en muchos de los otros países, se identificó que podría haber este, desviado pues, más de 30 millones de dólares de recursos públicos de este estado de Veracruz a través de todo el esquema de uso de empresas fachada o empresas este fantasma así denominadas en eh, digamos de manera coloquial esquemas de corrupción y lavado de dinero pese a que tenía todas estas acusaciones encima se fue a Guatemala fue extraditado de Guatemala llega a México se sigue un procedimiento penal y primero él es uh, señalado en una eh, parte primordial del procedimiento penal por delincuencia organizada, lavado de dinero, digamos, vinculado al tratamiento que le dio a estos recursos este, por los que estaba siendo investigados. Eh, desafortunadamente, después de esta parte de acusación inicial, en la segunda parte, cuando ya el caso debería definirse si se iba a un juicio o se solucionaba, por ejemplo, por un plea bargain, eh, la decisión de la fiscalía fue cambiar los cargos, es decir, se 
se le redujeron los cargos de, de crimen organizado, dejando únicamente el tema de lavado de dinero con un esquema muy corto de participación con otras personas. Y finalmente se le dio la opción, en México el sistema penal permite que las fiscalías sean las únicas que puedan proponer un plea bargain, en este caso a la persona que está siendo investigada, y en definitiva le ofrecieron una sentencia de nueve años de prisión y más o menos dos mil seiscientos dólares de multa a cambio de declararse culpable por todas estas acusaciones. Entonces, desde Tojil eh, identificamos que este esquema únicamente sería posible en un lugar en donde justamente como los antecedentes lo señalan, pues no tiene sentencias por casos de corrupción, no tienes este, ningún esquema eficiente de investigación de los delitos y que muy posiblemente esto ocurrió por un nuevo acuerdo de corrupción entre los fiscales y el exgobernador Duarte. Presentamos una denuncia para que nuestra organización pudiera tener el carácter de víctima dentro de este procedimiento penal en contra de los fiscales. Y aquí creo que un punto muy importante es que en México el papel de las víctimas es completamente amplio. Las víctimas tienen derecho a presentar evidencia, controvertir las decisiones del fiscal, controvertir las decisiones de los jueces. Entonces, verdaderamente en nuestro país las, las víctimas son completamente, como bien lo señalaba Naomi, tanto un mecanismo para reparación, pero también para lograr verdad, justicia en, en los casos relacionados con corrupción. Entonces, aquí si le puedes dar vuelta a la siguiente, Adri, rápidamente para platicarles el esquema legal en el cual estamos basando este análisis al anterior. ¿Por qué creemos que, no, la del círculo rojo? ¿Por qué creemos que Tojil puede tener este carácter de víctima ante un procedimiento penal? Básicamente estamos fundando esta acción en el gran eh, cobertura que nos establece la Convención de las Naciones Unidas, que en el artículo 13 nos dice la sociedad civil debe participar en la, en la investigación y el combate a la corrupción. La Constitución establece en México los derechos de las víctimas y muy interesante el artículo cuarto de la ley de víctimas de México establece que se deben considerar como víctimas del delito a asociaciones, organizaciones sociales en los casos en los que el delito sea de afectación colectiva, es decir, que no solo afectó a una persona, sino que afectó a un grupo generalizado de personas. Y de ahí, pues, de, de, lo hilamos con el Código Nacional de Procedimiento Penal y llegamos a la conclusión de que Tojil tiene este carácter de víctima. Entonces, eh, eh, llevamos esta solicitud a la Fiscalía, se nos negó en un primer momento, Después controvertimos, controvertimos esta decisión ante un juez, eh, digamos, de primera instancia a nivel federal. Nos negó también este carácter de víctima, pero en junio de 2019 pasó algo muy interesante, que es que un juez de amparo, a través de esta figura de amparo que seguro está en algunos otros este, países de América Latina, ganamos una primera resolución que nosotros identificamos como una resolución histórica en México, en la cual un juez de amparo ordena que a Tojil se le debe dar el carácter de víctima dentro del caso y permitirle participar con todos los derechos que de manera amplia tienen las víctimas previstas en nuestra Constitución. Entonces, eh, ese es un gran antecedente que tenemos a, en, a nivel nacional. Después de esto, la Fiscalía controvirtió esta determinación ante una Corte Superior que se llama un recurso de revisión, pero es una Corte eh, que puede revisar estas determinaciones de amparo, pedimos que la Suprema Corte atrajera el caso, se negó a traerlo y finalmente este corte revocó la sentencia que habíamos ganado. Entonces, el gran punto es que ahorita estamos justamente, eh, presentamos una petición porque una vez agotados todos estos mecanismos de derecho interno, eh, creemos que tiene todas las posibilidades de ser analizados por el sistema interamericano a través de, de la admisión, desde luego en la Comisión Interamericana y en su caso en la Corte, lo cual podría generar un precedente de gran impacto para toda América Latina y quizás otros países. 
Entonces, lo mismo estamos haciendo en caso Odebrecht, que creo que ya no, no, no quisiera abundar un poco más, pero pues agradecerles mucho, creo que va a ser un diálogo bastante enriquecedor para todos los que estamos aquí. Gracias. Thank you, Stephanie and Adriana. I'd now like to introduce the Director of Lawyers Without Borders Canada, Pascal Paradi, to speak about two emblematic corruption cases in Honduras, the Gualcarque and Pandora cases, and the central role of and challenges for the victims in those cases. Welcome, Pascal. Thank you so much, uh, Anna. Uh, greetings to all participants, uh, colleagues. Um, so as our name indicates, uh, we're a group of persons involved uh, in programs aiming at fostering access to justice for a better implementation of uh, basic human rights. And um, a while ago, we were, um, we were discussing on our key takeaways and lessons learned uh, from our work in Africa and in Latin America in fighting corruption or in collaborating with local organizations in fighting corruption. And there, are, there, there were like seven key takeaways. The first is that uh, when you want to fight corruption, you have to, uh, to go from talking to doing. Taking a stance on corruption is important. Corruption proliferates in silence, in secret, in tacit or express acceptance. So let's talk about it, or even more, let's do something about it, really. The second is that you have to, to adopt a human rights-based approach on, uh, on fighting corruption and on corruption itself. It's a violation. It's multiple violations of human rights. The third one is that civil society is a, is a real pillar of the fight against uh, corruption and impunity. The fourth is that access to justice and strategic lit litigation of emblematic cases as explained by Adriana Greales de Tojil, are key levers uh, to the fight against corruption. The fifth is that legal, the legal framework, nationally and internationally, laws and regulations have to have teeth. The sixth is that independent commissions that will be addressed by my colleague Philippe in a few minutes are a way forward. And the, and the seventh is that human rights defenders, journalists, anti-corruption activists and whistleblowers have to be protected. So today I'd like to focus on the on, on really on, on, on today's topic, which is uh, civil society as a pillar uh, to the fight against impunity. To do that, um, uh, we'd like to get inspiration, um, uh, hear about good practices and lessons learned uh, from the great work of partners in Honduras. Um, it's a work that we've been uh, supporting, uh, amongst others, through a project called Governance, Justice, and Fighting Impunity in Honduras with the support of Canada. The partners uh, we are talking about are the Centro de Estudios para la Democracia, CESPAD, el Consejo Cívico de Organizaciones Populares e Indígenas de Honduras, COPIN, el Bufete de Estudios por la Dignidad, BED, Bufete Justicia para los Pueblos, BIP, el Consejo Integral para el Desarrollo uh, de la Mujer, CODINCA and la Confederación Nacional de Trabajadores del Campo, CNTC. So uh, while we're looking at inspiration and good practices, we'll also look, of course, at challenges faced by victims in accessing justice in cases of corruption. More precisely, we'd like to use two very concrete examples, the Gualcarque and Pandora cases. Both were brought forward uh, by the Mission Against Corruption and Impunity in Honduras, MASI, uh, once again, of which my colleague Philip will be talking in a few minutes. Um, so um, the Guacarque cases, uh, the Guacarque case has to do with irregularities in the approval of the construction of a dam in the ancestral territory of the Lanka people. It generated two different cases, one criminal case against the persons accused of having committed uh, the assassination of Berta Cáceres, and a, a penal case, a criminal case against the civil servant uh, having falsified documents or having defrauded the state. Um, so both court cases have shown that denouncing corruption 
that the lack of prior consultation with the Lanka people regarding the dam that affected their own community and pushing back against the dam's construction resulted in the assassination of the well-known human rights defender, Berta Caceres. So that's one of the cases. The second one is the Pandora case. In the Pandora case, the, 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 the public ministry in Honduras is investigating a group of civil servants who allegedly funneled public funds that were earmarked for supporting women peasants to the political campaign of various political parties. So it's a criminal case. Uh, originally, there were 38 persons that were accused. Four are now confirmed, are set uh, for trial, but 22 have been exonerated by a series of questionable court decisions, which the public ministry is appealing. And meanwhile, a number of uh, civil society organizations are also trying to claim in court their right to participate in the judicial case. And they are arguing at the same time against the exoneration of the 22 persons we were talking about just a few minutes ago. So some features in common to, the, to both cases. One, we're talking about the illegal funneling of public funds that were meant for public services. Second, the impacts of corruption of the, this funneling of public funds were felt mostly by persons in situation of vulnerability, persons that are historically excluded groups such as indigenous communities, for instance. Third, the operation of criminal networks involving public servants, private individuals, and members of organized crimes, uh, of organized criminal groups that together co-opted key public institutions, thus undermining the rule of law. So there are three common features to both cases. Another very important common ground is that both cases were sparked by civil society. Civil society employing deliberate strategies to focus on the victims and foster their own capacity to access justice in those two cases. So the victims themselves denounced the alleged acts of corruption with the support of civil society organizations. And thus they are at the very origin of the investigation by the special unit called UFESIC. Also, the victims sought to actively contribute to the investigation and to actively contribute to the judicial case as private accusators, which is a concept in Honduran law, which is close to that of civil party in other countries. And also civil society has organized itself to monitor the investigation process and to monitor the court process too. So these actions by civil society had very concrete results. They sparked the court cases they brought focus on the most concerned by corruption, the victims themselves. They brought light on the real concrete impacts of corruption on the life of the victims, multiple violations of the human rights of women, children, peasants, indigenous communities, etc. And they also generated a vivid public debate. But there are also some drawbacks. In spite of their great efforts in numerous legal actions and motions, the victims have not been granted official status as a party in both cases. Therefore, they are officially excluded from the cases, which prevents them to autonomously voice their arguments within the investigation and within the court case. The victims and their representatives have suffered a number of threats also and physical attacks which are most probably related to their actuation to promote their, their own access to justice. So this victim's exclusion from the cases originates uh, in a structural factor that affects not only Honduras, but also other countries in Latin America, as Naomi Roth Ariadza was mentioning earlier. Criminal proceedings are viewed first and foremost, uh, are focusing on a breach of the relation between a civil servant and the public administration. Thus, civil servants are sued because they have diverted public funds or goods, thus violating their obligations towards the state itself. The accusation is not complying with her or his duty towards the state or falsifying documents, for instance, which are crimes against the state. So the human rights part is basically ignored in the cases. 
So this is a respective interpretation of what is a victim. And once again, uh, Dr. Naomi Roth Ariaza was referring just to that. It excludes, it excludes other types of impacts, impacts on funds or goods others than those of the states, on persons other than the state itself. As a result, we have a very paradoxical situation such as this one. The very indigenous communities affected in their way of life, in their cultural practices by the construction of a hydroelectrical plant on their ancestral territory will not be able to legally argue on the criminal responsibility of those who allegedly are responsible for acts of corruption which permitted the very construction of said plant. So the truth is that the spirit and text of the United Convention, Convention Against Corruption, as was mentioned earlier today, is, is, is to the contrary effect, that the victims should be heard. They have a right to be heard. They have a, the right to actively participate in court cases. So the experience in Honduras, and I'm concluding with that, shows that there are a number of things that state, states and civil societies have to work on jointly to ensure the right of the victim to be at the center of court cases on corruption. We have to push through jurisprudence and legal reform for a revision of the victim definition and status in court cases on corruption to reduce the barriers to their participation. Second, we have to advocate for a recognition in judicial proceedings of NGOs' roles in defending collective interests, as was mentioned earlier also. Third, we have to revise investigation protocols and train investigators to shift the focus of the investigation to include the impacts of corruption on human rights and on the affected populations. Fourth, we have to establish programs to protect victims and whistleblowers. And fifth, we have to foster access to information and transparency in laws and regulations and mechanisms. So we do hope that the state parties will make room for these call to actions in the final declaration of this assembly. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pascal. Our next and final panelist today is Philippe Tremblay, senior lawyer at Lawyers Without Borders Canada. Philippe will share with us some of the lessons that can be learned from the experience of international anti-corruption commissions in Guatemala and Honduras and the role for civil society moving forward following the termination of both of these missions. Welcome, Philippe. Thank you very much, Hannah. Uh, it's a real pleasure for me to be here today. Um, I'm going to focus my intervention on two recent experiences. That is to say, the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, better known under its Spanish acronym, CISIG, and the mission to support the fight against corruption and, and impunity in Honduras, better known as MAXI. Uh, because of the limited time at my disposal, I'm not in a position to address the circumstances that gave rise to these mechanisms, nor are the functions that their members were expected to carry out. But what I can do, however, is to display an in-house comparative chart that will allow you to appreciate some of the similarities and differences between the two structures. As it happens, both the CSIG and the MAXI were hybrid rather than fully international entities. Their membership was partly made up of foreign experts who worked alongside local professionals whom they were expected to assist and advise. In our view, those hybrid commissions represented a non-precedented example of effectiveness in investigating, in investigating corruption cases in Latin America. However, we must remind ourselves that those commissions would never have, ex have existed if civil society had not been so insistent on the pressing need to resort to foreign and independent expertise to uproot corruption. Not only were the international commissions able to design a coherent agenda of reforms for state authorities to carry out, to contribute to the establishment of domestic legal frameworks to effectively fight corruption, and to strengthen the capacities of local prosecutors to investigate and prosecute emblematic cases of corruption, such as the one that were alluded to by uh, the former speaker, uh, Pascal, but they were also instrumental in channeling the mobilization of civil society against the, the adverse consequences of corruption. Furthermore, while the presence of anti-corruption commissions encouraged many civil society groups and human rights defenders in both Guatemala and Honduras 
to rethink their role in fighting corruption. It is also through that civil society organizations made CC and Maxi benefit from their own knowledge of the, pol the local political landscape, as well as from their own perspective on corruption, which, which was shaped by their proximity with the victims. Uh, some factors related to civil society organizations explain how both the CCIG and MAXI were able to provoke significant reforms aimed at strengthening the local capacity to effectively investigate and prosecute perpetrators of acts of corruption. First, though political support from local authorities and their international partners is key to their success, and for that matter, for their survival, International commissions such as Sisig and Maxi know and knew that securing popular support was even more crucial as it provided the mission with the legitimacy it needed to serve its purpose. In this regard, the civil society organizations of Guatemala and Honduras fostered the backing of the international commissions by the population, a posture that later enabled them to pursue the anti-corruption agenda of those mechanisms upon the termination of their mandates. Unfortunately, this mutually beneficial partnership between the commissions and the civil society organizations was abruptly interrupted by the unilateral decision by the governments of Guatemala and Honduras to oppose the renewal of the mandates of the CICIG and MAXI after re respectively 12 and four years of operations a decision that was followed by important setbacks in both countries, including the appointment to key positions of high ranking public officials and judges who were not committed to the fight against corruption, and in some cases, proactively worked to undermine any attempt at making anti-corruption schemes efficient. Today, in the face of this bleak environment, the mobilization of anti-corruption civil society organizations is more important than ever. It is indeed essential to ensure that what was achieved by CICIG and MAXI is retained and that the structural reforms that were called for remain on the political agenda. The various actors who make up the anti-corruption community had to adjust to the new reality and think of new ways to advocate for their states to build on the legacy of those experiences. In Honduras, the Coalition Against Corruption brings together those NGOs concerned about the extent and impact on corruption in their countries. While in Guatemala, the so-called Alliance for Reform was founded when the CICIG was still in operation. To a large extent, it is those State non state actors who now embody the fight against corruption and keep the flame alive, so to speak. In Honduras, for example, since the Maxi left, civil society organizations and human rights lawyers have engaged in the private representation of victims in legal proceedings, as was uh, explained uh, earlier during the event. They also engage in citizen monitoring of ongoing corruption cases that were initiated when the Maxi was still around through trial observation and legal analysis as a way to democratize criminal justice. They also engaged in awareness raising around the root causes and the main factors impeding an effective fight against corruption, as well as communication campaigns to highlight the nexus between corruption and human rights and give exposure to the victims of corruption. Furthermore, we cannot fail to mention the role of civil society in participating in the construction of a narrative that unveils the various forms corruption can take, the way political and private actors engage in corruption, how they use gaps in the law to their own advantage, and how corruption impacts on human rights. By using a language based on human rights to shed light on the phenomenon of corruption, its causes and consequences, and by putting the, the victims at the center of their case for robust anti-corruption policies, the civil society organizations in Honduras and Guatemala set the stage for difficult but important discussions on the need to provide victims with adequate reparation measures. Uh, civil society organizations also recognize it is of paramount importance to oppose any discourse aimed not only at 
delegitimizing the anti-corruption missions themselves, but also at attacking the professional integrity of the people working for them. In both countries, some of these people were the object of threats, while others were prosecuted based on false grounds. Civil society organizations have opposed these accusations and tried to ensure that witnesses, legal practitioners, and social communicators involved in anti-corruption work at the domestic level be safe from fear. They did so in a variety of ways, including by providing legal representation to those subject to judicial persecution because of their past affiliation with Maxi and Sisi. Now, in terms of recommendations moving forward, any discussion on the advisability of setting up an international or hybrid anti-corruption body in a particular country, in our view, ought to address the following needs based on past experience. The need to agree on a long enough mandate period to allow tangible results to surface as investigating cases of corruption takes time. Define an, e an exit strategy from the outset, as well as identify the institutional reforms that are necessary in order to tackle corruption and how these reforms could translate in concrete programs. Establish a plan to ensure the sustainability of the reforms beyond the lifespan of the of the international missions, meaning putting some thought into how the expertise is going to be transferred locally, the type of resources that will be needed to follow through on commitments and so on and so forth. And last but not least, it is important to promote and implement enhanced security measures for anyone associated with international or hybrid anti-commission commissions as was pointed out earlier by my fellow speakers. I'm going to stop here. Thanks very much for your, for your attention. Thank you, Philippe. And thank you to all of our panelists for your insights. We have just a couple of minutes for a question and answer session, and we've received a number of questions. Um, as has been mentioned today, corruption has often been framed as a victimless crime. And today I think has been a wonderful opportunity to highlight not only some of the direct victims of corruption in individual cases and who they are, but the importance of centering victims and the civil society organizations that accompany them in anti-corruption processes. Something which as we've learned today is no easy task. On that note, I'd like to begin the discussion with a question we have for Naomi regarding who the victims of corruption are, something you and our other panelists talked about in your presentations. So we know that according to international law, victims are people who've suffered harm. Given that corruption harms society as a whole, how can states differentiate victims of corruption from society at large? Thanks, Naomi. So this is, of course, one of the key questions, right? Um, is there a way to uh, recognize the collective nature of the harms, but still also recognize that there are cases in which there are specific individuals, groups of individuals or collectivities that are particularly harmed? Um, I think that there are two ways to do it. One way is the sort of second version of what I talked about, which is using representative organizations to represent uh, collective interests. Uh, that's one way to do it. It, of course, raises a set of questions of, you know, how do you uh, ensure that those organizations are themselves legitimate uh, and are uh, able to represent those societal interests? That's one way to do it. Another way that some states use that I, you, I like less well uh, is that they use the inspector general or you could think about the human rights ombudsman or you could think about other places in the state that might play that role. So in Colombia and Costa Rica, it's the Procuraduría who represents so-called social harm. Uh, that, of course, raises the question of what if they're captured themselves, right? Uh, so it doesn't solve the problem altogether, but it provides another way of going. Another way of doing it, it seems to me, is to say, okay, are there ways in which this is more than just about um, the harm to the society as a whole? Are these 
are there collectivities? And I think the Honduran case for me is the paradigmatic example where, you know, the, the Lenca people are suffering harms to their land, to their resources, to their physical integrity uh, that are above and beyond the losses to Honduras as a whole. And so I think that gives them uh, you know, a, a particular interest. Another way states have done it is to say uh, it has to be a, an individual or a group that has denounced the wrongdoing. So that's another line that you could draw. Um, I'm not uh, saying that it's easy, but I think that that is the direction that we have to go, is to find ways of establishing where there is individual harm, collective harm, multiple individual harm, and social harm. And to see those all as categories of harm that need to be named and need to be taken into account. Thank you, Naomi. Our next question is for Pascal. Pascal, I wanted to ask if you could briefly discuss the relationship between transparency and access to public information and the effective prosecution of corruption crimes. Transparency is a condition to fighting corruption, really. Uh, first of all, as, as mentioned earlier, the, the laws and regulation, the legal framework has to be revised to make sure that the state has a duty to actively be transparent, to be open, to be open not only to request for access to information, but to itself uh, provide information. But also the mechanisms have to be, uh, have to be um, set so that civil society has a way forward to demand access to justice, uh, to, to demand access to information. Having the information is absolutely key to understanding the patterns of corruption, to understanding who is involved in these patterns. So really the two are absolutely related. And that's why uh, strategic litigation, for instance, is also a key lever uh, to foster access to information. So cases to access to information are then related to cases to fight corruption and to establish the responsibility of the individuals, institutions, persons responsible for corruption. So the two are absolutely related. Great, thank you, Pascal. Um, we have a question for Adriana. Um, Adriana, in your presentation, in Latin America, corruption networks who have reached the political elites use a powerful tool. They tend to dominate the anti-corruption narrative and they use that narrative against anybody who questions them, including and especially human rights defenders, investigative journalists, civil society anti-corruption organizations like Tohil. So in order to have an effective fight against corruption, um, a communication strategy is a key element. How do you manage this aspect communication uh, in your work? Es, es una pregunta muy interesante y voy a poner un ejemplo. Cuando se comunicó, y esto no solo se dio en el caso Duarte, sino en los casos que hoy en día, los grandes casos de corrupción que están siendo investigados, el caso Odebrecht, que es el caso Slash Lozoya, el caso de la estafa maestra, en todos los grandes casos de corrupción que hoy se están investigando y que están pendientes a llegar a una sentencia, muchos de ellos, incluyendo el caso Duarte, se ha llegado a una noción o un acuerdo, y este acuerdo, como en el caso Duarte, se ve como una victoria, es decir, desde la retórica y la narrativa de parte del gobierno se ha manejado como una victoria, es decir, decir Duarte fue sentenciado a nueve años y a reparar el daño por 2.600 dólares, aun y cuando, y se pierde de vista, y logran manipular a los medios de comunicación y dicen, se hizo justicia. Entonces, si tú le preguntas a las personas hoy en día, dices, oye, ¿estás de acuerdo? ¿O te parece que el gobierno ha actuado bien en cuanto a el caso Duarte? ¿Lo manejaron bien? La gente diría, sí, por lo menos... Eh, está sentenciado o por lo menos estará en la cárcel algunos años. Aquí detrás de todo esto, de esta gran narrativa que se ha creado, está que para lo que algunas personas ha sido una victoria, para las personas que conocemos el sistema y los problemas de corrupción internos, es un fracaso de justamente del Estado. ¿Por qué? Y eso me faltó un poco explicar, específicamente en el caso de Duarte, es porque probablemente el exgobernador Duarte va a salir con buena conducta en cinco, cinco años, o sea, va a llevar cinco años de cárcel 
cárcel, no va a haber pagado reparación del daño y eh, en cinco años esta persona va a salir con todos los recursos que fue desviado y no los va a regresar ni al Estado ni a las víctimas, ni va a haber, como se dice, una justicia transicional de decir las víctimas vamos a, a resentir que fuimos reparados. Entonces, últimamente eh, ha sido una estrategia desde nuestro gobierno manejar que todos los acuerdos que se, los, a los cuales se están llegando, no solo en este caso, sino nosotros, venderlos como algo victorioso, venderlos como que por fin se está impartiendo justicia. Sin embargo, quiero dejar algo muy claro, es en México, desde hace seis años, incluyendo en el gobierno actual, no ha habido ni una sola sentencia condenatoria en contra de ninguna persona por gran corrupción. Todo lo, hoy en día, todas las investigaciones están llegando a acuerdos, utilizando la propia ley, pero acuerdos que son ilegales, están aplicando plea bargains donde no debería de haber, y están vendiendo, utilizando los canales de comunicación a la gente, diciendo que sí están haciendo algo por la corrupción, cuando en realidad no, y ese es un tema que me podría profundizar mucho, pero ahí comentaría. Y rápido, ¿qué estamos haciendo nosotros? La verdad, nuestro esfuerzo de comunicar es muy limitado porque tenemos el gran problema de, de que es los problemas técnicos, o sea, el, el yo explicarle a las personas por qué técnicamente un acuerdo reparatorio, por ejemplo, no, no aplica, o en un caso en particular de corrupción, es muy tedioso y muy técnico y pierdes la atención del público. Entonces, sí estamos haciendo un esfuerzo, sí creo que es algo importantísimo tener a los comunicadores de nuestro lado que entiendan y que le digan a las personas que no se está impartiendo justicia y que lo único es que se está disfrazando esta, esta pseudo justicia, eh, más bien se está disfrazando la impunidad con esta pseudo justicia que se está impartiendo en nuestro país. Gracias, Adriana. Thank you, Adriana. I have one, we are basically out of time, but I have one quick question for Estefania and one for Philippe. So I'm going to give them both now and then I'll give Estefania the mic and then Philippe, and then we will close today's event. Um, the recognition of human rights civil society organizations as corruption victims is a huge achievement. Uh, but as you discussed, there are many obstacles to victim participation and recognition in practice in Mexico. And you outlined the way this vicious cycle of corruption and impunity is reproduced. Touching on something that Naomi mentioned, and given your experience as civil society victims of corruption, how do you think we should think about fighting for reparations for corruption victims within this challenge? challenging landscape. That's for Estefania. And for Philippe, Philippe, you talked about the bleak environment in the wake of CCIG and Masi's termination and departure. I was wondering if you might discuss the possibility of new anti-corruption missions in the region. What do you think is possible and what, we might, what might we look for on the horizon in terms of international commissions against corruption and impunity? Okay, Estefania and then Philippe, and then we will close. Gracias, Hanna. Creo que efectivamente es un reto enorme que tenemos encima. De hecho, justo en los casos que, como, que hemos llevado hasta el momento, uno de los grandes debates que, como bien lo señalaba Naomi, que se han dado en tribunales es cómo una organización puede acreditar el daño que directamente le fue causado por este acto de corrupción y ante la falta de elementos como objetivos claros para un daño y una reparación, estos han sido como los elementos que han llevado a criterios negativos por parte de los jueces. Entonces creo que un gran paso al que hay que avanzar es a entender que esta afectación, por ejemplo, en casos de corrupción dentro del sistema criminal, generan una afectación y un daño colectivo social que tiene que puede ser cuantificado y analizado y que todavía hay que profundizar mucho más en ese punto para avanzar al paso de la reparación pero creo que justo ese es uno de los grandes este, obstáculos que hoy se tienen para el combate a la corrupción a través de estos casos de litigio thank you Felipe Uh, well, as a matter of fact, as some of you may know, there's uh, an international commission that was set up in El Salvador, more or less along the model of CICIG. It's called CCS, on the International Commission Against Impunity in El Salvador. Now, we know that El Salvador is going through uh, troubled times, so, so we like to think that uh, these uh, political challenges are not going to impact negatively on the, on the work of the CCS, and that the CCS will be able to carry out its work uh, autonomously uh, and with the support of, of civil society. Uh, now, in terms of, of other, whether or not other countries might be tempted to, to establish a, a similar type of, of commissions, then it all comes down to political will, right? Uh, 
We, we know that some governments have expressed interest in, in existing or past models, trying to see whether these could be adjusted to their, to their own re reality. But at the end of the day, I think what's important is that is to give the population the sense that uh, the polit political will to fight corruption is there. Now, if I go back and, and I'm going to stop here with that example in, in Honduras, I think what prevented the civil society in Honduras from wholeheartedly pushing its weight behind the maxi was the sense that uh, the, the mandate of the, of the mission had been negotiated behind closed doors and that that model that was offered and that had been agreed upon was perhaps uh, not as strong as the CCG. So the population felt that uh, maybe the government was trying to fool them. It's only over time and when they realized that Maxi was doing its work that was taking its responsibility seriously that they realized that uh, they needed to, 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 to support the Maxi. So, 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 so I would say that political will and some degree of transparency would be important for, for other, other models to emerge across the region. Thank you, Philippe, and thank you to all of our extraordinary panelists. I'm sorry that we don't have time to take more of your questions. Um, thank you also to the special session of the General Assembly, again, for making this event possible, and to all of you who have joined us, and to all of you who join us in the fight against corruption from civil society, not only in Latin America, but from across the world. It's an honor to share this space with all of you, uh, to be able to connect virtually, to share our stories and experiences and ideas. And I think that this is the start of an ongoing conversation that, that we're going to have. And um, I wish you all the best, a wonderful afternoon, evening, morning, and thank you again. <laughs>